I'm going to begin by telling you a story. This was written in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 18, verses 9 to 14. And don't, tur don't turn there necessarily. You can if you want, but I want you to really get into the story, right? So um, this, is something, this is something that we're cultivating in our community, a culture of, of loving the stories in the Holy Book that are about real people, and also loving our own stories, learning to tell our own stories, loving hearing other people's stories. So I'm going to tell you a story today about, this is a story that Yeshua told about two guys. One of them was a really strict religious leader. And the other one was a crooked tax man. And he knew that he was a crooked tax man. Now, this religious leader was called a Pharisee. That was a movement in Judaism in the Second Temple era of people who were very, very strict in their observance of Torah. And you know what? For the most part, it was a good thing. Yeshua commended them for how scrupulous they were in their devotion. However, they also had some issues that Yeshua hammered on occasionally, right? The other guy was a tax collector. Now, as you know, 2,000 years ago in the land of Israel, the Romans were occupying Israel. What would be an example of that today? What would be an example of one country occupying another country and, 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 and sucking a lot of money out of that country, brutalizing people and um, committing injustices? Maybe, maybe, uh, maybe the Nazi occupation of various countries in Europe would be an example. If you can imagine how, um, let's say, the Dutch people felt about the no Nazi occupation. If you could multiply that by like about 10 times, you'll get some idea how the Jewish people, people felt about the Romans occupying Israel. All right? Now here's the thing. The Romans needed some guys to do their dirty work for them, collect the taxes. So they had the system where you could be a tax collector, and what you do is you'd collect the taxes for Rome, and you were free to collect as much above and beyond that as you wanted. You could totally gouge people, you could totally rip people off, you could be extremely unjust, and if people didn't have the money or they didn't want to cough up the money, you had the backing of the Roman soldiers to come and uh, kill people or beat people or do whatever you wanted them to do. So tax collectors, they were, they were a really mean breed of people. They were like the ultimate traitors, like the backstabbers of the nation. And everybody hated their guts, and you could see why, right? So this, these are the two guys that Yeshua tells this story about. The Pharisee, who was like the strict religious leader, and then the crooked, dirty tax man with a really mean past. And Yeshua says, these two guys both went to the temple in Jerusalem to pray. And the Pharisee, the really strict religious guy, he went right up to the front and he stood there and he said, Oh, God. Thank you that I am not like other people. Oh, God, I give you 10% of my income. I tithe on everything. And, oh, God, I fast. Not once, once a week, God. I, I fast twice a week. Not only every Monday, every Thursday. Oh, God, I'm such a good person. Thank you that I'm not like adulterers, or crooked swindlers, or any one of those other dirty people all over my city. Oh, oh, and that tax man in the back. Thank you, God, that I'm not like him. Oh, oh. So anyway, this, this religious guy, he was just praying on like this, right? And um, the crooked tax man, he was, he was sitting in the back, and he was like so broken. Because this wasn't like, well, this isn't one of those arrogant tax men who thought he had it all together and had his stupid justifications for ripping people off. This guy was really broken. He knew he'd done wrong, right? So he, he, that, that's why he was in the temple. So he just sat in the back and um, he, he, he couldn't even look up. Like the Pharisee was like, all like this, right? This guy was so broken. He just, he, his head was bowed. His, he was just so broken. He could, he, could, he could barely even sit up. And he just, and he was, he was, he was hitting his chest. And I guess in, in our culture, we don't do that. Maybe people in extreme forms of grieving do. I don't know. But, but in the Jewish world, if you're, if you're hitting your chest, it's like a sign of agony. It's a sign of like, I'm hurting so much. It's like a sign of mourning. Like at a funeral, that's what you do, right? And he was doing that. And he was just saying, oh God, I'm such a sinner. Please have mercy on me. And that's the story. And Yeshua finished that story by saying, those guys both went home that day. 
And guess, one, guess which one went home good with God? Guess, what, guess which one went home justified before God, right in the eyes of God? It wasn't the religious leader who was up there saying, Oh God, thanks that I'm not like everyone else. Look at all the good stuff I'm doing. And counting all of his good deeds. Yeshua said, It was the dirty tax man. It was the crooked guy. So, we're going we're gonna to discuss that story a little bit. You remember the four questions that I'm going to be asking after I tell these stories. The first one is going to be, who is Yeshua? And who is Yeshua's God? What does this tell us about him? Uh, the, the second is going to be, what does this tell us about the good news about Yeshua? Because you know what? Yeshua is a great guy. And he's a hero. And he comes through for people. And whatever the news about him may be, it's always good news. And you know what? This world really needs good news. You read the paper, you flick on the news, most of it is not good news. Most of it is negative. Like really, we need more positivity in this world. And Yeshua came to bring that in the ultimate sense. Um, thirdly, what does the story tell, tell us about Yeshua and his kingdom? Because guess what? His kingdom isn't like in the sweet by and by. His kingdom is here and now, in our midst. We are living in his kingdom. We have a counterculture. It's like... We live in a countercultural kingdom. We're going to ask, what does this story tell us about that? And then finally, we're going to ask, what does this story tell us about following Yeshua? So let, let's jump into that together. Um, here are some things that this story tells us about who Yeshua is and who his God is. Firstly, this story tells us that when, that when people pray, God listens. God pays attention. And that's really crazy because this, like planet Earth is so expansive. The universe is like infinite. They can't find the end of it. And there's a, there's, a, there's a person who created all of space and time. And I mean, I'm like a little itty bitty teeny tiny speck. But this story tells us the creator, when you talk to him, he's listening to you. He's paying attention. Uh, secondly, this story tells us that when people who are broken and hurting and dirty and messed up, people who have done horrible things, if they're willing to talk to God, apologize, and ask for help, He accepts those people. Um, there's a, from, from the ancient Hebrew prophets, there was, there's, a, there's this line of poetry that says, you know what, God is, God is close to people with broken hearts. God, is, God saves people with crushed spirits. There's another line where it says, even though God is so holy and he's, he's exalted so high up, he's also right down there with the broken people. So it's kind of like, you can, it's like it's saying, God is way up there, but he's also way down there with the guy in the gutter. And that's what this story tells us about who the creator is, how he relates to people. Uh, thirdly, this story tells us that God is the one who decides whether people are good with him or not. God is the one who makes people right. Uh, th th there's, a, there's a technical term for that. It's called being justified. Everybody say, being justified. Being justified. So if God says, you're good with me, I see you as a righteous person, he, that, that means you are justified. And what the story tells us is, God does that. Now, this is the difference between what Yeshua taught and what every other great spiritual teacher and world religion teaches. Listen very closely to this. Every other great spiritual teacher and world religion that I can think of teaches you make yourself good with God. You justify yourself before God. You get right with Him by what you do. All right? So even it's supposedly faith in the divine or whatever, very often it's more about faith in me, which is called humanism. Right? Now that isn't what Yeshua taught. Yeshua taught something radically different. He started a movement of people saying, you know what, I can't do it. God is the one who makes me right with him. God is the one who decides whether I'm good with him or not. And that's the major difference between what followers of Yeshua believe and what most other people in other religions believe. Most other people in other religions believe they can pull themselves up by the bootstraps and do it themselves. And we've kind of owned up to the fact that we're human and maybe some of us have tried and it just doesn't work. And we are not embarrassed to say, yeah, I need help. I need help. Um, fourthly, we learn from this story that God doesn't like pride. He likes proud people in the sense of loving them and wanting to, you know, be in a re be, have a relationship with them and maybe help them out. 
but he doesn't like pride. So this is how Yeshua finished the story. He said, do you know which of those two guys went home good with God? It was the crooked tax collector. And then he said, because the people who set themselves up and who lift themselves up and exalt themselves, God's going to take them down. And the people who humble themselves and lower themselves, he's going to lift them up. So did you hear that? If, if someone's like kind of pulling themselves up like that, you know, getting on their tiptoes, looking down their nose, maybe getting a little snotty, a little snobby or something like that. Come here, Colin. I'm going to do a little example of this. Okay, so let's say that that's you, okay? You're just getting a little snotty, a little snobby, kind of getting up on your tippy toes, okay? Just don't look at me, look around. Just look, look down your nose at other people. Okay, this is what he does to people like that. This is what's called a takedown, okay? He goes, oh! <laughs> and he takes people like that down, okay? So if you're getting all pride and you're setting yourself up, God's going to do a takedown on you. And um, I, do, I do Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, so I've been learning lots about takedowns lately. They're really fun. Are we done? Yeah, we're done. Thanks, buddy. Actually, no, bro. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to... Here, we're going to do one thing. Okay. No, this is the opposite. This is humble people, okay? <laughs> no, you're good. I'm going to... Here, you just sit down on the ground. Let's say you're just yeah. getting down real low. You're just being a really, like... Instead of climbing the corporate ladder and trying to, you know, get yourself way up there, you're just, you're just sitting down on the ground. You're being humble. This is what the Creator does with people like that. Hey... And he picks them up. Thanks. Thanks, buddy. It's great having you around again. I get, to, I get to do demonstrations with you I couldn't do to <laughs> Genevieve or Summer or somebody. You know? yeah. Yeah. So what, what's, what's the gospel from the story? What's the good news that we get from the story? Basically, I already told it to you. Like, when you are broken, when you are hurting, when you knew that, know that you have done dirty things and you have wronged other people, he is there for you. If you want to come to him, if you want to say, I am sorry, I'm really sorry, and I need help, I need your mercy, he is so there for you, and he's going to come through for you. And he's going to say, you know what? Let's start again right now. You are good with me. I am making you righteous from the inside out. That's, that's the good news from the story. It's good news for people in Prince Albert. What does the story tell us about Yeshua's kingdom that we are living in right now? About us as a countercultural people? Um, here are some things, and I, I think we could say this, is, this applies to us as we're followers of Yeshua also. Um, firstly, we keep it real. The story teaches us that in Yeshua's kingdom, we keep it real. We want to be open with Him and with each other. Be authentic kinds of people, right? If we have, if we, if we have crooked past, if we've done dirty stuff, if we were like the proverbial tax collector, we're not going to like kind of run and try and start a new identity. We'll just be like, yeah, this is part of my story. And this is how he showed mercy to me. This is how he made me right with him. Right? Um, secondly, this story teaches us that in Yeshua's kingdom, when we pray, we talk to God from our hearts. We can be so real with him. We can keep it simple. We can just say, God, I am such a sinner. Please have mercy on me. And you can go home and he will accept that from you. Uh, thirdly, this story teaches us that in Yeshua's kingdom, we value humility. We value seeing how low we can get, how much we can humble ourselves, instead of trying to jack ourselves up or put ourselves out there. Because we believe in a creator who sees us, even when we're in the dark, when we're in, when we're in the secret place, when we're down at the bottom. And Yeshua says, and he's going to pick you up in his time. Uh, fourthly, this story teaches us that in Yeshua's kingdom, we think about how we can get lower, not higher. And fifthly, this story teaches us that in Yeshua's kingdom, we accept people who are broken, who are hurting, who are dirty, who are messed up, who have done horrible things, if they're really sorry, if they're asking for help, because that was us, and that is us. And sixthly, this story teaches us that in Yeshua's kingdom, we are not all about ourselves and the good things that we've done or the good things that we're doing, right? We're not the guy who's like, ta-da, look at me, I'm here. It's the, it's the other way around. And then seventhly, the story teaches us that in Yeshua's kingdom, we don't think we're better than everybody else. Like the Pharisee dude, right? And along those lines, eighthly, finally, this story teaches us that in Yeshua's kingdom, we don't compare ourselves with others. 
Right? It's, it's so easy to do that. It's so easy to, to say, well, look at me, I'm doing more than that person, or look at me, in this area of my life, I'm better than that person, and you end up comparing yourself, and the problem with that is, when, you, when we do that with anybody, anybody in our community, anybody in the city of Prince Albert, when we do that, when we separate ourselves and we start talking about I and me, instead of us and we, when we start talking about them and they over there, you're going to start making that separation. You're going to start seeing yourself as better. Like the Pharisee, right? So those are some things that we learned from this story that Yeshua told. So I am going to just give you now a flash preview of these chapters. Or maybe it'd be a post view because I'm assuming that you've read them this week. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll look at the Gospel of Luke first. In chapter 18, Yeshua tells a story about a woman. She was a widow, so she was severely disadvantaged in that culture. And she needed a just decision. And so she went to the judge. And this judge was not a righteous dude. And she just bugged him every day, every day, every day. And Yeshua finished, the, and finally the judge gave her what she wanted. And Yeshua finished the story by saying, you know what, God is a just judge. Not like that unjust judge. So you know what, if you're praying to him, if you're crying out to him, he's totally going to hear you. And he's totally going to come through for you. Then um, Yeshua told this story that we just talked about, the, the two guys praying. Um, next in that chapter, this wealthy civic leader walks up to Yeshua and he says, Master, what, what do I have to do to, to, to live forever in the afterlife, to have chaye olam, eternal life? And um, Yeshua and him have this little discussion about keeping God's commandments. And evidently, this guy's a really good guy. He's very religious. And Yeshua says, you know, you still need to do one more thing. I want you to go home, sell everything you have, like liquidate your assets, and then come and join my band of disciples. Give all your stuff to the poor and then come follow me, right? The guy walked away and, and he couldn't do it. Yeshua really challenged him. And then find, the last story in Luke 18 is a blind man outside the city of Jericho and he is desperately yelling because he, hear, he heard that Yeshua is coming by on the road. And the crowds are all telling him, you're making a scene, shut up, be quiet. And he won't stop yelling and guess what? Yeshua hears him, Yeshua heals the guy, he gets his sight and he joins the merry band. Awesome. Uh, Luke, in Luke chapter 19, Yeshua tells, there's a story, uh, again, about in the city of Jericho, about a crooked tax man who is um, challenged in stature. He's really short. And he climbs a tree to see if he can see Yeshua, and Yeshua ends up coming to his house. And uh, he makes things right. Um, there's also a story, Yeshua tells a story, it's like a parable story, right? About a nobleman who's going to go on a long distance and receive a kingdom. So he gives three of his servants assets. And he says, I want you to invest these assets, do business with these assets. And when I come back, we'll see how you did. And uh, I'm not going to tell you the rest of the story. This is a great story, though. And then finally, at the end of Luke 19, Yeshua rides a little donkey surrounded by the merry band of his disciples. He, he rides into the city of Jerusalem and everybody is like freaking out with joy. Like there's so much celebration, you know, they're throwing their hats in the air and throwing their, their, uh, their bunny hugs and jackets on the ground. And, uh, and everyone's like, yes, it's the king, he's coming to our city. And right in the middle of it all, he, Yeshua just breaks down and he starts bawling. And everybody probably just kind of stopped and stared for a second. And he prophesied, that Jerusalem would be destroyed, that it would be surrounded by a foreign army, that it would be totally turned, torn down, that people would be massacred. And um, he said it was because Jerusalem didn't recognize the time of its visitation. So that was a prophetic word that Yeshua gave to a city. And I would suggest to you that Yeshua continues to look at cities. He looks at his people in a city. And I believe there are times when Yeshua comes to a city and he says, I'm coming to the city right now. This is your time of visitation. It's critical for you to recognize that I'm coming and to respond to me. So that's something that we get out of that chapter. Uh, another thing we get is when Yeshua talks about things like the destruction of Jerusalem and the second temple, he doesn't do it with a straight face in the sense of like poker face, no emotion. He, he, there are tears in his eyes. He is crying. So when Yeshua, let's say, talks about the Shoah, what most of the world calls the Holocaust, I guarantee you, he does not talk about that with a blank look on his face. He is crying. That is something very close to his heart because the Jewish people are his family. In Luke chapter 20, the religious leaders confront Yeshua in the temple. He's sitting there. He's teaching. People are flocking to him. He's healing people. Kids are running around. They're having a great time. And uh, the religious leaders come and they confront him. And they say, who told you you could do these things? 
who gave you authority to heal these people or to teach here? And um, this is classic, just so you know. This is what control freaks always resort to. These guys were not asking this question because they cared. They did not care if someone sent Yeshua or not. They did not care why he was there. The only thing they cared about is, this is our turf, we have our norms, we have our standards and it's going pretty good, and we are in control. And this guy is a threat to our little system that we've established. And we need to get rid of him. So when they came to Yeshua, they weren't coming because they really cared. You've got to understand that, right? They came because they, they had a system and they, they didn't want to have anything interrupted, right? And you can see from the rest of the story that they don't really care. Um, Yeshua went on to tell a story to them about, um, about a guy who had a, a vineyard. And uh, he planted this vineyard, really nice. It was going to be really productive. He rented it out to some, some vine growers, kind of like, uh, you know, hired hand farmers. And then he went off on a long journey. And um, the end of the story goes that they actually reject the guy who owned the vineyard. So he comes and kills them all and gives it to some new people. And uh, the, the, the religious leaders realized, Yeshua was telling that about us. Um, some other guys that came and tried to stump Yeshua about uh, giving taxes to Caesar or not. Yeshua gives a, a brilliant answer that um, circumnavigates their, uh, their, their treachery. And then the end of it, so like these guys, they're like, um, you could almost imagine like there's this lineup of guys and they all want to take on the champ, right? And so Yeshua is like the champ. So he's like sitting there and you can just imagine one guy coming up, right? And he's down. And then another guy comes up and he's down, right? And then, and then the last scene, the Pharisees are all hanging out and Yeshua steps right into their midst Poof! and he asks like this, this smasher of a question and he has them totally stumped and, and they don't bother him anymore. But the story finishes by, uh, it says Yeshua looked over at his disciples with the religious leader standing right there and he said, Watch out for these guys. And then he started talking about all of these things they do that are inconsistent, that are, that are hypocritical, right? Like Yeshua was a very gutsy individual. Um, so that's, that's our readings from the Gospel of Luke, just to give you an overview. Um, we also are reading from the Torah, from the book of Leviticus, uh, chapter 16 to 20. It's two, two portions. Acharei Mot is the first. It's called that because, um, because God spoke to Moses after the death of Aaron's two sons and then um, Kedoshim, which means holy people. So I'll give you an overview of these chapters also. And as, we, as, as I give you an overview, just be asking, what, what, do, what do these passages tell us about Yeshua and his kingdom? What, 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 can we, what do these passages tell us about how we can follow him? Some practical things here. Um, and, and we'll be talking about this with the assumption that the Torah, the first five books of the scriptures, are, are still relevant to us. You remember Yeshua said that in his kingdom, the people who practice these commands and teach other people to do them, are the people who will be great in his kingdom, right? Uh, in Leviticus chapter 16, it gives us an ancient, an ancient day of observance, an ancient ceremony. Um, there's one day a year when the Jewish people, they don't eat anything or drink anything for a 24 hour block of time. If you ever go to Israel, it's a day in the fall, and like everything grinds to a halt, right? Almost everybody just stays home. And it's a day when the Jewish people fast and they just, they pray a lot and they do a lot of uh, soul searching. And uh, it's called Yom Kippur. Yom is day, Kippur is atonement, right? So it's the day of atonement. Uh, it's, it's in your daytime, right? I'm sure many of you have read it there and looking at us today, I think all of us have, have observed that day. I'm sure lots of us have gone hungry that day and done some real deep soul searching and stuff, right? But um, the word Kippur, I mean, this is the Hebrew word of the day, okay? It's kafar. Everybody say kafar. And it means to cover. Like when it says that Noah covered his big boat with uh, tar, the word there for covering is kafar, right? So he kafared his big boat with tar. And um, this is that word. It means to cover. And um, it's where we get the word Kippur from, like Yom Kippur. So when we hear this word atonement, think covering. Everybody say covering. Um, there's another Hebrew word that has this root. It's kapara. Everybody say kapara. Kapara. Yeah, kapara means like a, it, you can sometimes mean a lid, like a lid on a box, or a, a covering of some kind. It's also the word for atonement or propitiation. That'll be another fancy theological word for us today. Everybody say propitiation. Propitiation. Yeah, propitiation is when you have done something wrong, and instead of you paying the penalty, someone else covers for it. Someone else pays that penalty for you, right? That is kapara, propitiation. Now, on this great day, 
when the temple was standing, it's the, the tenth day of the seventh month on the, the calendar of Israel in the autumn, the, the Kohen Hagadol, the high priest, he would go into the inner sanctum of the temple where only one guy went only once a year. And he would cover for his own sins, for the sins of his family, and for the sins of the whole nation, millions of people. So it was a day when everybody who had done something wrong in the last year was in a lot of suspense. Because it was the one day when they got their sins covered for, so they'd be good for the next year. That's kind of the idea. So the high priest would go in and he would atone for everybody, and it also says that he would cleanse everything. So covering and cleansing are the two big things that would happen on that day. Have you ever noticed that like, Deep in the human psyche, I think all of us feel this need to be covered. Like, you know, at the very beginning of time, when there were only two people around, they ran around without any clothes on. And they didn't feel any embarrassment or shame. But after they sinned, they all of a sudden just felt, I need to be covered. And so they made themselves these little shorts out of big leaves, right? That's, that's the first example of there's this deep need in the human psyche to be covered. Have you ever noticed that often when you're talking with someone, they're guarded, they have a mask, they don't open up very fast, they are covered. So it's uh, some examples of that. Um, have, you ever, have you ever heard the phrase, someone might say, I've got you covered? That's a good expression, hey? If someone tells you, I've got you covered, or I'll cover that, it's a, good, it's a very good feeling that we have. It has, then that can have a nuance, uh, several nuances of meaning in different uh, situations. I think you, you also notice there's a really deep need in human beings to be cleansed. And I mean, a lot of people deny this, right? But deep down inside, so many people in our culture, they wrestle with feelings of guilt. They struggle with feelings of shame. They just feel dirty inside. And you know, for people who maybe were abused as children or later in their lives, often that will also leave a feeling of dirtiness. You just feel dirty inside. And um, this, this day in Israel was the day that represented being covered, having all of your crimes and your sins and the horrible things you did, having those covered, taken care of, out of the way. Nobody's ever going to see them again. And it's a day when everybody was cleansed. They were just able to let go. They were able to open their hearts. And they just felt that cleansing coming through them. That was the idea of this day. And um, here's a question. Why? Why did the high priest have to keep doing this stuff over and over and over again? Well, it's because there were new generations that kept coming, I suppose. But what happens when the temple isn't standing? What happens when the high priest can't pull off that covering and that cleansing? Does that leave all of humanity in the lurch? Or could it be that that high priest was a picture of the Son of God who had come as our high priest to cover us once, once and for all? to cover for our sins, our crimes, and to cleanse us from the dirty stuff we've done, to make us clean inside so that we can be open, so that we can be free, so that we can, we can be free from, sh like from guilt and shame. Yeah, so Yom Kippur is totally a day about Yeshua and what Yeshua has done for all of us as humanity. Um, there are a couple key phrases in the Yom Kippur passage that I, I, I really grab me. One of them, it says, this, the high priest does this, achat b'shana. He does it once a year. What about Yeshua? Yeshua accomplished that covering and that cleansing once for all time. He did it. He pulled it off. Um, it also says that when the Kohen Haggadol, the high priest, goes into that inner sanctum, only he is allowed in. And no human being is allowed in with him. It's a picture of what you're going to do. Are you going to let Yeshua alone cover for your sins, cleanse you deep within, or are you going to try and maybe slip your own efforts in there too? Maybe help them out a little bit. Or maybe get there just through your own maybe positive thinking or um, good psychology or uh, whatever, or, or good works or being a religious person. You know, a lot of people do that. But this, this passage tells us, no, Yeshua is going to be the guy to do it for you. Let him do it. Accept it. And then finally, Yom Kippur was the day when everything ground to a halt. Nobody worked basically just sat there all day, right? I mean, when you're not even allowed to eat or drink anything, there's not much to do. And I think that's, that's also a picture of, are you going to do the work yourself, try and do the work yourself, of getting right with the Holy One, of cleansing yourself from whatever filth might be in you? Or do you think, maybe you'll let Yeshua do that, and you'll just sit down, look to Him. Those are some things that we learn in this, uh, in this Parsha. Interestingly enough, Paul and his apostolic team in the book of Acts they kept track of when Yom Kippur was. 
in Acts chapter 27, verse 9, we have these chapters that are like Luke's travel journal when they're traveling on a ship. And he says they were at a certain location and the fast was already over. It was late in the fall, early winter. The fast is a reference to Yom Kippur. So Acts 27, verse 9, I think is very solid proof that Paul and his apostolic team observed Yom Kippur as a day to look to Yeshua, the high priest, and commemorate the cleansing and the atonement that we have through him. In uh, Leviticus chapter 17, the next chapter, um, God says some things about animal sacrifice. Now, how many people in our culture sacrifice animals as an expression of worship to God? How many people go to church and they're like, okay, so today we have a bull, we're going to bring the bull up to the front. And like, People don't really express worship that way. But in the ancient world, that's how everybody expressed worship, right? If you wanted to like worship the gods, you'd kind of get an animal, cut the throat, burn the thing on the altar. That was just how people did it. And, um, what, and um, what, 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 what God says here is, to Moses to tell Israel, I, I want the people of Israel, when they're going to do their animal sacrifices as, as worship to me, I want them to come to my tent and do it in my tent. I don't want them to just go here and there and do their, their, every, their thing wherever they want because they'll be giving their worship to other, other beings. He uses the word sirim. Everybody say sirim. It's the Hebrew word for goats. He said, I, I want them to worship me. I don't want them to worship the goats. Did you ever notice that one of the pictures of Lucifer in, in sa Satan worship is the goat. The, the pentagram with the upside down star is a picture of a goat head. Kind of interesting. Wonder where they got that from. It's a really old concept. The, the, like the, the forces of evil are pictured by the goat. So people today don't really do a lot of animal sacrifices in worship, but what, what could we get out of that? What, what could we get out of this? Um, how, how do people worship today? I, I have a little list for you here. People express worship today by cheering by working hard for something or somebody, by dreaming about something or somebody, by wanting, desiring, craving something or somebody, by adoring and, and giving something or somebody your affection, um, by spending a lot of money on something or somebody. Often, when you look at what people get, like, do this for, you will know who or what that person worships. Because as human beings, we were created to worship. We all worship something or somebody. A lot of people are like, no, I don't. I don't worship nothing or nobody. I'm strong. I'm independent. They worship themselves, right? Everybody worships something or somebody. And so anyway, what we can hear the Creator saying in this passage is like, I love you and I want you to come and worship me. Don't worship other stuff or other things. You might actually be worshiping like the forces of evil behind the world system. You might actually be worshipping the goat demons and not even be knowing it. Come worship me. Give, me. give me your cheers. Give me, spend money on me. Give me your allegiance and your affections. You can hear the Creator's heart in this passage saying that. Um, Yahweh, God, in this passage goes on to say that uh, when you, like an animal or a person, their life is in their blood. So when an animal's throat was cut and the life drained out of them, it was like a picture of that animal dying for the person, so that the person wouldn't have to die. The animal like, gave its life for the person. That was the, that was the understanding of, of, of the people of Israel. And um, that leaves the people of Israel hooped when there is no altar system, when there is no possibility of sacrificing animals. How are you going to atone for your sin? You've sinned. Someone needs to die. Someone's blood needs to be shed. And so for believers in Yeshua, we have the answer. Yeshua died in my place. His blood was shed for me. It's finished. But for people who don't believe in Yeshua, it's a very, it's a very difficult place to be. You end up, again, just doing it on your own, with your own religion, with your good works, expecting that you will somehow atone for your sins, that you will somehow cover yourself, as if you were the high priest. I don't know. I, I would rather not go that road personally. In uh, Leviticus chapter 18, we have to understand something. At the very inception of time, when there were only two human beings on the earth, there was a man and there was a woman, and they were married. They had a covenantal marriage relationship. And Yeshua, he asked that question once. He said, how was it in the beginning? Because that's the way it's supposed to be today in relationships. Um, Anything outside of that wasn't the original intent, right? Leviticus chapter 18, God begins by saying, Okay, guys, you're in this period of transition. Behind you is Egypt, and in front of you is Canaan. And these people are filthy. They have 
sexual relations with anything that moves, basically. And he lists all of these really dirty things that the people back in Egypt did and the people in Canaan did. Basically, anything and everything outside of like intimate relations in the context of the marriage covenant between a man and a woman, they would try it. And um, he goes on to list a whole bunch of dirty things I'm not going to mention. He uses some words to describe that, like, those practices are lewd, they're perverse, uh, they're gross. That's what he says, right? He really hates it when people do that stuff. He considers it disgusting. And he finishes that chapter by saying, when you commit things like that, when you engage in those behaviors, it makes you filthy. And it also makes the country you live in, it makes the very land filthy. This is relevant because people in our country do filthy things. Um, people in this city do filthy things. The things that were banned in this chapter, people do. And uh, that's why Yeshua came, to save people if they want to take him up on the offer, to, to, drag, to pull him out of the mud, to clean him up, to give him new lives, and um, hopefully, ultimately, to cleanse whole geographical areas and countries. And we pray for that in our city and our country. Uh, in Leviticus chapter 19, this is a really fascinating chapter. It goes, brrr, and it gives this long list of, um, of mitzvot, of commands. Some of them, you'd call them positive mitzvot. God says, do this, do that. And then others are what you'd call negative mitzvot. God says, don't do this or don't do that. And uh, I'm just going to sum up a couple of them for you. And as I do that, I have three questions that you can be asking yourself in your mind. It's like the three Ps, you could say. Um, on, on a physical level, when he says, don't do this or do this, you'd call that the practice. Everybody say practice. practice. Right, and that's always what you want to start on. You just want to start with saying, what does he say on a literal level? What can I, how can I apply this to my life? The second level is what you'd call the principle. And it's not always explicitly stated, but it's the why. Everybody say principle. principle. So the first is practice. What does he say to do or not do? The second is principle. Why do you do or not do that? And sometimes he tells us, sometimes it's not for us to know. And then thirdly is the person. Everybody say person. person. Who is it who said this? What does this command tell us about who he is? So um, let's just go through a couple of these here and um, ask yourself that. What does, what's the practice he says? What's the underlying principle? And what does this tell us about the person? You could say uh, practice, principle, person. Or you could say what, why, who. Um, either way. Um, he says, honor your parents. Keep my Sabbaths. When you're bringing in the harvest, leave some in the field for the poor of your area. Don't steal and engage in false business dealings. Don't depress your fellow. Pay out your employees on time. Don't make fun of deaf people or trip up blind people. Respect God. Don't go around telling stories about other people in the sense of slander, gossip, juicy tidbits. It's the equivalent of murdering them. Don't hate, your, don't hate your fellow in your heart. If he's doing something wrong, confront him. Rebuke him. Challenge him. Have it out with him. Don't hold grudges. Love your fellow just like you love yourself. Don't practice spirituality like divination, sorcery, occult, wicca, fortune telling. They, those are real practices, and they are real spiritual experiences, but they will put you in touch with the dark side. Um, take care of your daughter. Make sure she doesn't, you don't put her in situations where she will fall into immorality. Respect the seniors. Honor the elders in your community. When they walk into the room or when they talk to you, stand up as a sign of respect. And then finally he says, you know the immigrants down the block from you? You know the stranger that just moved in? Be kind to that person. So those are, those are a couple of practical things that he says in this chapter. And just, just, just shout it out to me. What does that tell you about who he is? He is... Considerate. considerate. Impartial. Hmm? Compassionate. Inclusive. Inclusive. Just. Just. Yeah, I, just, I love that. It's, it, it's sad too because often these chapters get bashed because there are a couple of commandments that have been misunderstood. Like uh, let's say Dan Savage lately went on a rampage with a bunch of, uh, in front of a bunch of high school kids bashing the Bible and Christianity. And I mean, it's kind of classic. People always say the same 
the same things. And it's not like they really care. They're just kind of, they're saying things out of ignorance often because they're parroting what they've heard. But it's kind of sad because when you look at these chapters, the people of Israel were cutting edge when it came to equality for human beings, when it came to justice for all, uh, when it came to seeing that people in a society were treated kindly and fairly and right. Man, the people of Israel were like leading in the ancient world in that regard, right? That's the side they often won't tell you. Then finally, the last chapter in these readings is Leviticus chapter 20. It uh, prescribes capital punishment for a series of these banned practices, these crimes. And I won't list them all for you. But um, when you read through these, you realize the creator of the universe is just. And he regards some behaviors as right and some as wrong. Some of them he regards as very wrong. Some of them he says, you do this and you deserve to die. Justice says you should die for that crime. Yeshua when he came along, didn't loosen it up. He actually, it's actually like he took a ratchet and he just tightened up the whole thing. Like he just, he, made, he, he took it from being about my hands, what I do on an external level, to being about my head, what I think about, and my heart, what my motivation is, what I really want deep down inside, who I really am. You know? The classic one he has said is about adultery. Okay, maybe you don't physically commit adultery, but what are you thinking about? Do you fantasize? What do you want to do in your heart? You know, on that level, when we look at, when we look at these, um, these commands from God on that level, you begin reading through this list of a actions that deserve capital punishment, and, you, and, and, and I find myself saying, I've totally wanted to do that. I've totally thought about that in my mind. Something in my heart would actually really like to do that. And I realize, I'm on trial. I'm the criminal. I'm the one who deserves to die because what I've, I've done, according to the creator of the universe, um, from his perspective. And um, man, you finish that chapter and it's like, I shouldn't even be alive. I shouldn't be here. And uh, again, maybe that's where the good news comes in. There was a man who came and he was innocent. He committed none of those crimes. And he wasn't just like a good man externally. He was a good man in his mind. He was a good man in his heart. And that man died in my place and in the place of anybody who wants to accept it for themselves so that they could go free, so they could start again, so they wouldn't have to take the death penalty, either in this life or in the afterlife, in this world or in the world to come. So, woohoo for that! Yeah. Thank you for joining us in this message. I pray that it's been an inspiration to you and your discipleship to Yeshua the Messiah. Crown of Messiah is a relatively small congregation with a massive mission. We're not just making disciples and teaching the Word of God here in our city. We're also doing that internationally through vehicles such as the internet. It is our joy to offer you these messages for free at absolutely no charge. At the same time, we do have ongoing overhead expenses. It costs us something to produce these teachings and get them out to you. And we would appreciate it if you would, in turn, support our work in a practical way. Help us cover some of our basic expenses. You can do that by going to our website, crownofmessiah.com, and going to the donate page, where you can make a one-time donation, or you can set up a monthly automated donation. I'm reminded of the words of Yeshua's Apostle Paul in Galatians chapter 6. He said, Let the one who is taught the word share everything good with his teacher. So, if you're being taught the word by us, we would appreciate it if you would take the words of Yeshua's Apostle seriously and make some type of return for the blessing that we are giving you for free. That way, we'll all be in it together and we will be a team accomplishing the mission that Yeshua has given us. And you will go from only being a receiver to also being a giver. If you're like most people, finances are tight. We understand that. Finances are tight for us too. That's why we need people like you to come alongside us and to back us in the work that Yeshua has called us to do. Thank you so much for making that donation at crownofmessiah.com and thank you for becoming a team member with us. We appreciate it.